Why is ZU4 fun? That's a loaded question for sure, and it's something I'm sure many of us have thought about. But how do we break that down into actual answers, and what smaller questions do we have to answer to find a proper answer to the overall question? This is going to be a long video, which will have to explore many places to find a good answer. While the topic will remain focused, I'll be using other strategy games and ideas from even other genres entirely to support some of what I will say. Thus is the nature of an analysis of such a massive game. One thing I want to get out of the way is that this is not a retrospective. I will be analyzing EU4 as of its state today, looking at it as of patch 1.33, with patch 1.34 coming pretty soon. It would certainly be an interesting video though to analyze EU4's changes and movement from patch to patch, but that's a whole other topic which would expand this video's vision far too much. From what I understand, there is one more DLC planned for the game before development of EU4 ends and EU5 begins. I'm going to hope that the final EU4 DLC isn't so massively game-changing that the video can remain relevant even after. That being said, if you're a time traveler watching this after EU4's last DLC comes out, I sincerely hope this video won't waste your time. Another thing to get out of the way is that I'm basically going to ignore multiplayer meta talk, even though I love watching Absolute Habibi. That conversation is simply too massive to add in here. So, back to the question. Why is EU4 fun? I suppose it ought to be, how is EU4 fun? Or, what does EU4 do that makes it fun? Or even, in what ways is EU4 fun? And so on. But somehow the word why feels appropriate. It really encapsulates the feelings I have towards the game in terms of the life and money it sucked away from me, which I'd happily give again and again. EU4 has that funny thing about it, sort of like an abusive romantic partner. The good times are magnificent and the bad times are horrible. Such intense peaks and deep troughs have led me to play for tens of hours at a time and then to drop the game for months only to come crawling back for more. Now, as much as I abhor an abusive relationship, there's a certain magic, a hex really, that makes someone say stuck on one. Now EU4 I wouldn't say is a manipulative, paranoid, and control freak, but I can't help but label it as abusive. The most common response to should I get into EU4 is no, save yourself while you still can. I remember playing League of Legends as a preteen. I don't think I even have to expand on that sentence for you to know exactly why I'm mentioning that. But I'll inform you that I haven't lapsed back into League for a few years now, and the world looks just that much brighter each day. If you're watching this as an EU4 player, I'm sure you already understand the abuse that EU4 will throw at you. The RNG, the illogical interactions, the things you're unsure are bugs or features, the literally incorrect math, the multiplicative and additive modifiers, the power creep and useless mechanics along with just about a million other things which can only be categorically called flaws. Funnily enough though, EU4 has convinced its players that these flaws, inconsistencies and problems are just part of its quirky personality and that if you can't handle it at its worst, you don't deserve it at its best, and yes, I'm going to drive this metaphor into the ground. To understand why EU4 is fun, we're first going to have to figure out what exactly EU4 is. This video will be split into three sections. A brief, quote-unquote, outline of the game's base mechanics, a look at factors both internal and external as to why the game is fun, with supporting evidence, and finally, some of my opinions which I will support with evidence as I see fit, but which mostly will be conjecture. Before we begin to think of it though, I'd like to present to you this channel's very first sponsorship. I live in my mom's apartment off Granville Street, one floor down. My name is Killer 4269 I am 27 years old. I believe in taking care of myself, a balanced diet, and a rigorous exercise routine. In the morning, if my eyes are tired, I'll use some eye drops to moisten them before talking to my family. In the kitchen, I tell my parents I'm getting a job and that I'm almost done my CS degree. Then I go to my room and grab a bottle of Jovi Coffee Concentrate which I mix with water for about a minute while I watch my favorite Twitch stream. I always use one of Jovi's metal straws because they're reusable and make you look cool. There is an idea of a noob killer 42069, some kind of username, but there is no real information on my account, only a four digit discord code, something illusory. And although I can hide my tiredness with Jovi coffee, and you can hear me call your mom fat over voice chat, and maybe it even makes you feel like saying a similar insult back. I simply don't care. And didn't ask. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed that ad. If you know what movie that was based off of, put it in the comments. I just want to say that uh, this coffee brand here, Jovi, they're, they're really good. Okay, I, as some of you that know that watch my stream, I'm not much of a coffee drinker. But I have had some, and I have had my friends who are coffee drinkers have it, and they quite like it. So, hope you consider making a purchase. If not, supporting the stream and the channel, the best way to do that is just go ahead and watch the video. Hope you enjoy, and I'll see you next time. Hope you enjoyed that. Now let's talk about EU4 again. Let's get started with the outline. 
We're going to take a look at the major game mechanics of U4 and the major philosophies behind those mechanics starting from the ground up. If you've never played or seen U4, this section will be extremely helpful for you, and if you have played U4 before, then let this section give you some insight into the reasons why the game is the way it is. We all know U4 is just a map staring simulator. Oh, okay, for real. Let's talk about Grand Strategy. A quick Google search tells us that Grand Strategy is a term not just for the gaming sphere, but in fact for the real world too. Grand Strategy is actually pretty easy to understand at face value. Within politics and war, strategy is the set of ideas a state uses to obtain its goals and the ways in which a state pursues its goals, particularly with respect to war. Strategy is about logistics, troop movement, important targets, and of course, deception. Grand Strategy is the way in which a state uses resources outside of war to obtain its goals in war. In particular, Grand Strategy focuses in on the military implications of policy. In EU4, the Grand Strategy is composed of three broad categories, the economic, diplomatic, and the military. We can see this represented by the three mana points of EU4. Let's talk a little bit about mana points. It's what they're called in EU4's community, but they're actually called monarch points. These points are abstractions of higher concepts and are the basis for just about every mechanic in the game. There are a few ways to get them, but the vast majority of monarch points come from the competence of your monarch and their advisors. It's important to understand, if you're not familiar with EU4, how important these points are. They are everything. And whether or not you ascribe to great man history, EU4 certainly does. The difference between a bottom tier king like Enrique and a god gamer like Skanderbeg is torrential. The flood of points from a powered up monarch is worth more than any other resource in the game. Each of the monarch points are needed for things like technology and ideas, as well as being something of a currency for usage in developing your country's land, and for random events that can add more points or take them away as the RNG machine sees fit. We'll talk about how each of these many actions I mentioned in this section actually appear in the game as mechanics as those mechanics come up. For now, let's outline the point types and what each one represents as a quantification. The three monarch point types are administrative, diplomatic, and military points. Each point category is an abstraction of miscellaneous resources and powers within the government to accomplish certain tasks. Administrative points are your government's bureaucracy and organization, that your economic controls and your state's ability to effectively tax and rule over its people. Admin points can provide you with stability and they can be used to core new states and territories. They can be used to fix rampant inflation and they can be used to create public works that increase tax revenues from citizens. In a game all about empire building, the most important thing could be argued to be the economy, but this is why admin points are often the most important of any point type in EU4. An army with no wages is unmotivated. A citizen left untaxed is merely a burden. A state without the faith of its people is a figure. Admin points are your government's power over the internal and domestic issues which keep the state alive. Diplomatic points, on the other hand, focus mostly on the external. That includes foreign affairs, international trade, and the navy. Diplomatic points represent the sway your state holds over other states, both dependent and independent. More than that though, they are the influence your traders have in foreign ports and the productive capabilities of your nation's resources. Diplomatic points can be used to make demands in war, create protectionist trading markets, and peacefully annex dependent states, among many other miscellaneous uses. The other major use for diplomatic points is the promotion, demotion, and genocide of cultures. In essence, diplomatic points end up being amongst the least useful points if only because you can always do diplomacy by other means, but for some nations these points will be more important than for others. Diplomatic points are for the way your state deals with other states and the resources your state has for dealing with its people. On the other hand, we have military points. When diplomatic ask comes to push, comes to shove, then comes war. Military points aren't only about war, but they're all about aggressive acts, whether it's putting rebellious elements down with an iron fist, scorching the earth, whipping your men into walking faster, or some good old native genocide, military points cover any action that other people might not appreciate you doing. As a main mechanic in the game, war is just about everything in EU4. Winning wars, the strategies and tactics you use, and the rewards you get for a one war are the center of progression in EU4, with only a slim few nations being capable of entirely relying on pacifist strategies. Military points are most important for keeping up in military technology, which in EU4 is perhaps the most important indicator of strength as well as for promoting generals to lead your army. Generals in EU4 will make or break most battles, so having good ones means the world to an aspiring warmonger. Warmongering is perhaps the most direct way to get an edge over your rivals. EU4 is all about competition between empires, and the game's mechanics represent that through the rival system. When you mark an opponent as a rival, you utterly destroy any sort of diplomatic relations you could have had with them in return for bonuses and conflicts against them. This includes more than just war, as you can launch trade embargoes against your rivals for free, and you may get random events that give you claims to their territory, among many other possibilities. Rivalries in EU4 are the short-term storytelling tools that keep you focused. In a sandbox game like EU4, making your own goals can be tough, so in case you ever have no direction, just go screw over your rivals. 
Likewise, every AI state will choose rivals of its own, which could be you too, and they will politically maneuver to get in the way of your plans if they rival you. A state that rivals you is called your enemy. Not every rival is your enemy, nor is every enemy your rival. However, it is common that rivalry relationships go both ways. In the days of old, any nation could choose any other nation as a rival, but in today's EU4, a state can only rival another state that is on somewhat even footing to it. The fun part about rivalries is that they're not just a game mechanic. Your rivals are your goals and targets. To some extent, to focus only on surpassing rivals and repeating that gameplay loop is an entirely valid way to play, one which is both fulfilling and effective. As a storytelling tool, rivals even act as something of a loose tutorial. Finding ways to defeat your rivals is a creative, self-driven process, and many players could speak to how they learned the game's mechanics by just messing around until something worked. That's pretty much how I learned the game anyway. Learning how to outclass your rivals is probably the first learning curve you'll find in EU4. Understanding how to win wars using the aforementioned grand strategy is the point of the game. It would not be unreasonable to measure a player's competence in EU4 by their ability to use various aspects of grand strategy to come out on top against their rivals. When two nations engage in open conflict, there are two main ways they can assert dominance over the other, battles and occupations. Now, the mathematical details of war on a micro level are kind of insane in EU4, so I'm not going to go into extreme depth here, but I will cover the major mechanics that can give an army the edge it needs. The point of this section, more than anything, is to highlight the complexity of war, not to actually teach you how it works, if only because that would be a several hour long video on its own. I'm going to simplify everything about the military to make it digestible to new players, yet still analytically interesting to veterans. We're first going to talk about fighting between armies, and then about sieges. There are essentially four factors to consider when two armies meet on the field. Army size, army quality, leadership, and terrain. As a player, your goal is to do everything you can to make each of those four factors go in your favor. A larger, better, well-led, and well-positioned army will always win a battle, obviously, but where things get interesting is when only some of those factors are on your side and others aren't. Who wins? 10,000 Prussian Space Marines or 100,000 Aztec Warriors? The fun of warfare is what things you focus on and the ups and downs of each of those strategies. Quantity-oriented armies allow an overwhelming numbers to defeat armies and have a few particular tactics that make them effective. A quantity-oriented army has more manpower and cheaper units, making lost battles less costly overall, and they can spread themselves more thinly compared to other nations. The only problem is the difficulty these armies can have actually winning battles. The mass death takes a toll on a country's war exhaustion quickly, and the economy too, eventually. A classic example of a quantity-oriented nation would be Russia, whose own national ideas incentivize large armies. Quality-oriented armies use superior individual performance of units and high discipline to win battles. A quality-oriented army is generally superior to a quantity-oriented one in terms of outright winning battles, but can find itself low on manpower and claiming Pyrrhic victories if it lacks the economy and manpower to keep its armies supplied. It can also have trouble keeping large areas under control, although those areas they do control are kept tightly under their grip with elite troops. The point of leadership in an army is as a circumvention of RNG. A general adds flat modifiers to the dice rolls of battle. Every phase of battle between armies has between a 0 and a 9 roll, and a general adds anywhere from 0 to 6 to that roll. Generals also add movement speed and siege points to armies, making them extremely important for every army. Last factor is terrain, which can be the breaking point for many armies. Terrain determines combat width, and it gives flat negatives or positives to a defending and attacking armies similar to generals. For example, any army attacking into mountains gets a minus 2 to all rolls it makes. Quantity armies can have a lot of trouble in mountainous terrain because of the limited combat width, which determines how many units can be present in a battle at one time. Certain nations, like the Central Asian Nomads, get bonuses in flat terrain with their cavalry units, but for the most part, terrain acts as a negative to an attacker. This means fighting on the defensive is almost always preferable. These four factors make for the most important parts of determining who will win in a battle, and as a nation wins battles, they are more able to siege and therefore win wars. Despite the game's focus on battles, sieges are actually far more important to winning wars directly than the battles themselves. A siege is an attempt by an army to occupy terrain. I say attempt because sieges, at least in the early game, are drawn out affairs that require a large investment of men. Every province in the game takes one month to siege, but some provinces have forts that can take anywhere from a few months to a few years to siege. This is because EU4 sieges are actually entirely luck based, just like the battles, except that you have far fewer tools to improve your chances in a siege in comparison to battles. When an army stands on a fort, it has to have 3,000 men per fort level to start the siege. Forts range in level from 1 to 9, meaning as many as 27,000 men may need to siege a fort, before adding in modifiers that increase or decrease that number. Once a siege of a fort is done, it is worth significant war score, which is the measure of who is winning in a war. 
It ranges from minus 100 to plus 100%. Each part of a piece deal costs a certain amount of war score to demand, so obtaining war score is how a war is properly won. War score is primarily obtained via occupation, but also obtained through battles, blockades, and fulfilling war goals, which are different for every war. Think of war score as the amount of leverage your nation has over another, or vice versa. When it comes to player versus player interactions, war score actually is meaningless, since all it does mechanically is tell the AI how hard it's losing. The only mechanical implication war score has outside of AI influence is that if a nation sends a peace offer that is considered generous compared to the war score count, the recipient nation will take a hit to their stability if they refuse the deal. With enough war score, a peace deal can be agreed upon by both parties diplomatically, formally ending the war, with one nation presumably taking something from their opponent. Most often that would be land and money, but some wars might demand trade power or the annulation of treaties with other nations. The most attractive piece of a peace deal, however, is land, with its taxable citizenry and juicy natural resources. Taking land is the most direct form of conquest in the game, and it's a relatively simple concept in EU4. All nations have a core territory which marks it as belonging to them in a de jure sense. Most nations have their entire core territory as part of their nation de facto as well, but some don't. See France in the Hundred Years' War, with cores on Normandy and Gascony that are administered by England, who also has cores on them. To conquer a core is called reconquest, and to conquer anything else is simply called conquest. This begs the question, how does a nation expand its core territory outside of its starting boundaries? That's where those good old monarch points come in. Specifically, administrative points are the way that nations obtain new cores. When a nation conquers land, they initially have no core on it, and this makes it essentially useless to them. Uncored territory provides nearly no taxes, no manpower, no trade power, and also causes corruption at the higher levels within their nation, and most importantly, it increases a number called overextension. That number is extremely dangerous at higher levels, so keeping it low matters. Core creation is essentially the abstraction of the process involved in establishing a functioning bureaucracy and tax system that can make new land integrate into the larger nation smoothly. The more highly developed the province in question, the more administrative points it will take to add that province's people to the census, collect their taxes, charge tariffs on local goods, and draft their young men into pointless wars. Cores take a longer amount of time to create on provinces which do not share a culture or a religion with their nation, meaning that conquering people that have nothing in common with their new overlords is a more time-consuming process. A nation with no cultural or religious ties can expect to take a few years to core the new provinces, while a nation with matching culture and religion to its conquests may take less than a year. Once a core is complete, the province is now considered a territory of the coring nation. Beyond that, a territory can be given the status of state, more closely integrating it into the nation, at the cost of yet more administrative points and weighing more heavily on the nation's overall governing capacity. Once a province is cored and made part of a state, the next limiting factor for its usefulness to a nation is its autonomy. All provinces range in autonomy from 0% to 100%, which is essentially a measure of how much of the taxes you don't get. A province with 100% autonomy gives zero taxes, while a province with 0% autonomy gives all the taxes it can possibly give. Autonomy in this case is actually quite easy to understand as an abstraction, since in today's world autonomous regions are very much a thing. Consider a place like Catalonia in modern day Spain. Catalonia has a different state language, Catalan, and has some self-determination in various aspects of their governance in comparison to less autonomous regions of Spain like, say, Madrid. That being said, Spain is actually a very unique governmental system in that all of its states are somewhat autonomous in different ways. But let's just hand wave the real world political nuance of Spain for the sake of understanding what autonomy is in the EU4. The last note about conquests is that any province conquered through war will be extremely rebellious for a few decades due to separatist elements within that province that wish to return to their previous owner. If England conquers Paris from France, the Parisians won't accept that without a fight, and will continuously spawn rebel armies to try and return to France for a long time. Now that we understand how obtaining new land works, why don't we talk about losing land? Let's have a look at England and France in the Hundred Years' War to understand this concept. In the beginning of the game, England de facto rules over Normandy, Anjou, and the coast of Bordeaux. France also has cores on all those places, but does not de facto rule them. Normandy's culture is Norman, which is not the same culture as France's Francienne culture. Because of that, the cores France has on Normandy will eventually expire. It takes 150 years for a core to expire in this case, but that time is variable. Let's look at a scenario where England has lost Normandy to the Kingdom of France and no longer de facto rules over it. Their core is still there, but it will expire in 50 years. This is because Norman culture also is not the same as England's English culture, but there's one more degree of separation. Norman's culture group. Normans are part of the Frankish culture group, sharing a sense of identity with Francian, Occitan, Breton, Walloon, Gascon, and Provençal people. Meanwhile, the English culture is part of the British culture group, sharing an identity with the Welsh, Scottish, Cornish, and American culture. This means that cores on provinces which share your culture will last longer than cores with which you don't share a culture. The only cores that never go away are specifically marked cultures of specifically marked nations which are pre-written in the game. What I mean by that is that if England takes Paris, which is a Francian culture province, France will never lose their core on it because France is the primary nation of the Francian people. 
The reverse is true for England as well, who will never lose their core on London, and even for nations like the Ottomans, who never lose their cores on Turkish provinces. The only way to make a primary nation lose its core is to change the culture of the province on which it has a core. All provinces and nations in E4 have a culture, except uncolonized land with zero population, which will have no culture. The final step to cementing rule over a province beyond just a core, a state, and minimal autonomy is, well, to be frank, genocide. Any nation can spend diplomatic points to culturally shift a province to either the state culture, the neighboring culture, or back to the culture the province was before a previous shift. For example, England can shift Paris to being English or Norman since Paris borders Normandy, and England's state culture is English. Likewise, any other nation can always shift Paris back to Francian, even if Paris borders no Francian culture province and their state culture isn't Francian, since a province can always return to its original culture. Culture is extremely important in EU4, as a province with a non-matching culture will give fewer taxes, fewer men, and be more rebellious. There are three remedies to cultural issues in EU4. We've already talked about genocide, which is the most direct, most expensive, and most permanent solution. If England can take Paris, make it a core, add it to a state, drop its autonomy to zero, and convert its people to English culture, then Paris will be a solidly English province, with France losing its core on Paris once 50 years pass. All this process genocide because ultimately, the culture conversion button is an abstraction for the various ways in which a nation might change the majority culture of a province. There are many ways to do that, but all of them are genocide in some form. Whether it be assimilation, disenfranchisement, sending settlers, or outright murder, the diplomatic points used to do this are essentially an abstraction of the state justifying its actions in the government and to the outside world. False flag operations, removal of local power holders, Advertisements to natives telling them to settle new land, and the covering up of heinous acts done in the girl name of imperialism are all acts of genocide. Whatever genocide is occurring is up to your imagination, but rest assured that it is happening, even if it's not violent. The second option for dealing with new cultures is a bit of a compromise. Promotion. If England conquers enough Francian land such that the Francian people have 20 development points worth of land within the state, England can promote Francian culture within its state at the one-time cost of diplomatic points. This would mean that Francian people have full rights and citizenship within England, and can ascend the ranks as generals, admirals, and advisors. Every nation can only promote a limited number of cultures, meaning that choosing which cultures to promote is a big decision. That being said, a promoted culture is treated as effectively equal to the state culture, meaning that promoting Francian culture would actually place them at a higher level in terms of acceptance than the Scottish, even though Francian and English are in a different culture groups. Accepted cultures are a one-off cost that is limited by an arbitrary cap on how many can be made. This cap can be increased with technology and ideas. A culture can be removed from its promoted status for a small diplomatic point cost, and it will upset all the provinces of that culture, increasing unrest for some time. The final way to circumvent cultural differences is via decentralized ruling in the form of vassalization. If England conquers Brittany, they might choose to release the nation of Brittany as a subservient vassal that governs it for them. Vassal states rule over countries in the stead of their overlord, paying taxes to them in return for protection. Brittany in this case will function as its own nation state except that it will have no diplomatic independence and no ability to really do much at all besides manage its own internal affairs. Making vassals is free for any nation but it costs a diplomatic relations slot, which all nations have a limited number of. The problem with vassals is that they are a diplomatic relation like any, meaning that England must ensure the Breton government is okay with being ruled over or else they may declare their independence in a war with the backing of foreign powers. If England can do a good job of keeping relations with the Bretons cordial, then Brittany may like England so much that they'll even build up an army to help England fight the French. Ultimately, the goal of a vassal state is to essentially delegate the management of particular provinces that may be better suited to another nation's way of doing things, while also avoiding the administrative and diplomatic costs of managing that land. Because Brittany in this case is its own nation with its own monarch and internal policies, any land England allows Brittany to govern will cost England no administrative points to core. Instead, Brittany will spend those points. One of the big draws of vassalization is when a small nation has many de jure cores that can be returned to it by its overlord nation. For example, England rules over Gascony in the beginning of the game. One strategy England can use is to release the Gascon state as a vassal and fight to return all the Gascon cores France owns to Gascony. This has the dual effect of making Gascony happy with England and weakening the French. When a vassal has been ruled over by its overlord for 10 years and the two nations get along well enough, the overlord nation can begin the process of annexation during which diplomatic points will be drained every month to convince the subject nation to integrate itself into the overlord nation. Once England has fed all those Gascon cores to Gascony, they can start the process of convincing the Gascons to join England. The funny thing about this is that once a nation has been integrated, all its provinces will still be of a foreign culture and will have fairly high autonomy, but they will have no separatism. In many cases, vassals are a temporary solution to a cultural problem, but some vassals are so good they're worth keeping. 
One of my favorite examples of this is using the Byzantine Empire as a vassal since they have many cores in the Ottomans and the ideas that make them well suited to religious conversion. A Catholic Austria can easily vassalize the Byzantines, force them to become Catholic themselves, then feed the Balkans and Anatolia to them in the hopes that they might make all the people of those provinces Catholic. And once they've done that, the Austrians can annex them and enjoy a wealth of land with a matching religion. I mentioned the term ideas a few times, so you might be wondering what that means. So let's talk about perhaps the most important mechanic in all of the U4, ideas. All nations have a unique set of national ideas that shape their strengths and weaknesses. I mentioned earlier how the Byzantines are skilled at religious conversions. This is because of their national idea called Restore the Ecumenical Patriarch. Every nation has two traditions, seven national ideas, and one ambition. These are all effectively the same thing, but the difference is when they're unlocked. All nations start the game with their two traditions. Their national ideas are unlocked by unlocking ideas from idea groups. Each idea group has seven ideas which cost monarch points, and a final unlock for getting every idea in the group. After unlocking all seven national ideas, a nation unlocks its ambition. Similarly to how idea groups have a final unlock for completing them. These ideas are what make every nation feel unique and are deeply important to how EU4 is played. At certain levels of administrative technology, a nation will unlock a new idea group. These are a set of ideas based around a certain playstyle that all nations can access. For example, any nation can take quality ideas, which are all about creating a more quality-oriented army. These ideas cost 400 monarch points of their corresponding category. There are administrative idea groups, diplomatic idea groups, and military idea groups. Every three ideas from an idea group, a nation will unlock one national idea. Let's take a look at France as an example of traditions, national ideas, idea groups, and ambitions. France starts the game with two traditions, plus 20% manpower and plus one diplomatic reputation. Once France reaches administrative technology level 5, they can take their first idea group. Let's say France takes defensive ideas as their idea group. This idea group focuses on making sieges harder for the enemy, providing bonuses to fortifications and army morale in general. France takes three ideas from this defensive idea group and unlocks its first national idea called French Language in All Courts, which gives France plus one diplomatic relations. Over time, as France unlocks more ideas and more idea groups, they will unlock more and more national ideas. Once they finish the national ideas, they will unlock their ambition, which gives them plus 5% discipline. I'm not going to go into depth of what all these modifiers mean, since that would be far too much to cover, but essentially, ideas show off what a nation is good at. In France's case, they focus on diplomacy and war, with modifiers like Elan, which gives plus 20% army morale, and Vauban fortifications, which gives minus 20% fort maintenance. That being said, France has a pretty good spread of ideas, like a technology cost reduction, and an increase in heretic and heathen tolerance. Much of the meta of EU4 is measuring the power of each nation's ideas, with nations like the Ottomans, the Mughals, Austria, Italy, and Tuscany having insane national ideas, while other nations like, please forgive me for this one, my Madagascar viewers, Betsima Soraka, or Georgia, among many others. The nice thing about national ideas is that no nation is pigeonholed into any playstyle. The Ottomans, whose ideas are almost entirely militaristic and administrative, can play a diplomatic game if they want to. By the same token, a nation with terrible national ideas can still rule the world in any way that it wants. With ideas in mind, why do they even matter? What, ultimately, is really the goal of stacking all these modifiers? Given that EU4 is a sandbox game, the goal is what you make it. But the advertised goal of the game is essentially world conquest. There are a few ways to do that, but they all involve war. It's more about what ways you support your war machine. There have been pacifist challenge runs for EU4, but I'm going to put those aside as mostly unintended ways to play the game, and instead treat war as a necessity for the game. Every system in the game is built to support warring others. Diplomatically oriented nations will be able to conquer more land with less war score, and incur less of an opinion penalty with nations that see them as conquering too much. Administratively oriented nations can have more income to support their army, and have an easier time ruling over their people efficiently, and finally, militarily oriented nations simply win more wars against larger and tougher opponents. The point of this section is to highlight to you, the viewer, that EU4 is, no matter what anyone tells you, a war game. The whole point of grand strategy as a higher concept is to use resources from all aspects of a nation to support a war effort. The money a nation makes is invested into infrastructure only because that infrastructure furthers the war effort. The French nation invests in churches because those churches act as a bureaucracy to further tax collection efforts. Those taxes are reinvested into larger armies or navies, such that France might project her power against her rivals more effectively. The ultimate goal of EU4, barring world conquest, is to defeat all competition through military means. With all that said, this is likely the best place to end the mechanical discussion. With what I've gone over, you as a player now understand how to conquer land and how to engage in warfare, which are the only two entirely necessary mechanics to play the game. Beyond that, there is so much more that I simply cannot get into. Just remember that every single mechanic in the game is, whether directly or indirectly, 
created to facilitate warfare and conquest as the two primary mechanics of the game. I want to make it clear, this is just the service of the game, but it makes up 11 pages of the script. That's because this game is immensely deep, and ultimately the purpose of this video is not to go into depth about every aspect of the U4. The whole point of this section has been to give you, the perhaps unfamiliar viewer, an idea of what EU4 even is. Hopefully now you understand, and if you don't, there is a plethora of videos out there explaining in even more detail what EU4's mechanics are and how they work. If you want more information, go to those videos. If you're an already familiar viewer and you watched that section, then hopefully now you've got a cool understanding of the mechanics from more of an abstract and game design oriented view. I'm adding an intermission here as an opportunity to decompress, take in what you've heard, and remind you of where we are so far. We've covered the game's mechanics at a surface level at this point and talked about some of the main mechanics of the game. We did this so that viewers unfamiliar with the game can avoid feeling lost during the meat of the video, and so that familiar viewers could have a new way to look at the game they may not have seen before. From here, the discussion of the game will shift towards the question of what exactly makes EU4 so tantalizing as a video game, and the ways in which the game is fun. I'll be discussing things like skill ceilings and roleplay, as well as community and storytelling to explain the particular things that EU4 does that I believe make it fun. This section we split into two, first discussing factors in the game itself, and then discussing factors external to the game. Anyway, that's our first intermission, so let's go ahead and talk about why EU4 is fun. The game's multifaceted nature is definitely its premier feature as a grand strategy game. To understand what I mean, I want to pull back the lens a bit and look at two extremely different yet strongly connected games, StarCraft 2 and Devil May Cry 5. Now what the hell do those games have in common with each other, let alone with EU4? Simple answer is that they are extremely skill-based, with only minimal RNG components. I play both StarCraft 2 and Devil May Cry. I peaked in StarCraft as Platinum Terran in my heyday, and I've beaten every DMC game except two on Dante Must Die mode several times. You might say I'm something of a hardcore gamer. Wow. So, why was that fun? Why did I enjoy putting myself through the figurative hell that is StarCraft II ranked ladder? And why did I put myself through the literal hell that is Devil May Cry? The genuine answer to that is that I'm motivated by a desire for mastery. This applies to just about everything I do, and in particular the games I play. The most satisfying thing about both these games is seeing myself get better and better each day through study and practice. The only problem is that that's my opinion. For some people, DMC is fun because of the spectacle and the story. For some people, StarCraft is fun because of the cutscenes. This leaves the question of which opinion is most correct. Obviously, it's mine. I'm going to say something which could be a video all on its own, and which I've often cited in my other video essays. There are correct ways to enjoy a game, and incorrect ways. I should clarify by saying intended and unintended ways, to avoid ruffling too many feathers. If you're playing StarCraft for the story, and you declare that that's why it's fun, you are some level of correct, but how do we determine the most correct position to take about why these games are fun? In my opinion, we do this by analyzing the piece holistically, and with developer intention in mind. StarCraft is designed to be a complex, real-time strategy competition in which micro and macro skills determine who wins. The gameplay loop of StarCraft is simple that way. Whoever plays better wins, whether that's between two players or an AI and a player. Devil May Cry is similar, except it's not about just winning, it's about winning in the most stylish way possible. Devil May Cry winning is perhaps the shallowest way to play. The intentions of these games are informed by their mechanics. StarCraft's ladder tells us it's competitive, and the often symmetrical map design and multiplayer tells us that the game is about defeating an opponent on an even field. Devil May Cry's style system and score-oriented ranking system tell us that the game is about winning in the most dominating way possible. I'm talking about these games, not EU4, because in principle my thought process works with them easily and simply. Although StarCraft 2 and Devil May Cry have interesting stories that contribute to the fun of the game, the mechanics of the game did not tie into their stories heavily, and therefore I would say that the story is a smaller part of what makes those games fun. To recap, a game can be fun for many reasons, but some of those reasons are more strongly supported by the in-game evidence than others. That evidence takes the form of intentional design and the presence of mechanics that guide the player towards a certain kind of fun. Let's apply that way of thinking to EU4. EU4 is fun for a massive number of reasons, so let's take a look at some in-game evidence to find out which forms of fun are the most valid and intended ways to enjoy the game. EU4 is designed to be an empire-building simulator with a focus on warfare. The historical period was chosen because the Renaissance is the period in which feudalism is ending and proto-nationalism is taking form. People en masse in Europe are beginning to form identities around characteristics beyond their church, their lord, and their work. Cities are urbanizing, and political thought as a whole is evolving beyond the Ancien Regime. Your job as the player is to guide your chosen nation through this transitional process into whatever you want it to be. Now we run into our first problem with the analysis. 
EU4 is a sandbox game. This is what makes it problematic when compared to previous examples. EU4's design is not so intentional, rather it is simulational. When each mechanic is added into EU4, it's not necessarily because it would be the most interesting at a design level, nor is it heavily tailored to ensure it fits into the complex systems without a hitch. Rather, the mechanic is added in the pursuit of further historicity, the expanded sandbox. That being said, EU4's developers at Paradox are not idiots, at least not always. They do rebalance and tweak systems to make them more palatable as game mechanics, with some odd exceptions. An example of one of those exceptions is courthouses. The idea behind them is to simulate the governmental institutions required to make efficient governance possible. Consider governmental bureaucracy in the places you live today. For me, the Services Canada buildings that I've gone to before. As seemingly inefficient as those places often are, imagine if the only form of governmental bureaucracy was off in Ottawa. As an abstraction of local governance, courthouses make sense. But then we actually experience them in-game, and yeah, I don't know about all that. Unfortunately, you do have to build them in order to keep up in the game. The separation between what is meta and what is fun is unfortunately absolutely massive in EU4 at times. This raises another question. Why is building courthouses not fun? Sometimes, to answer a question, we have to answer its opposite. I asked legendary EU4 player Lambda about his opinion on courthouses, and he had this to say. Uh, theoretically, or like fundamentally, it's kind of cool, but like the way it's implemented, the, the only way to deal with it is to spam a building, which um, requires you to delete a bunch of buildings and stuff of that nature. It really uh, is like sort of tedium, I suppose. He also had this to say, which further informs why some mechanics are fun and others aren't. And in a sense, building slots have give you give the player some sort of choice, I suppose. Like uh, you have finite slots, what do you, what buildings you build. We can glean two things from this. One is that tedium is boring. Wow. <laughs> and the other is that player choice is a desirable state. This definitely makes sense given that EU4 is a sandbox game, and in that sense, we see something similar in our previously mentioned StarCraft and Devil May Cry examples. StarCraft players, and in fact any competitive game player, will complain when the meta forces a person's hand and kills their creative freedom. The only games where creative freedom is mostly irrelevant are rhythm games, which play into that concept of perfect mastery strongly. There are of course also exceptions to that with games like Crypt of the Necrodancer and even Osu to some extent, but you get my point. Before this goes off track, let's turn to what makes EU4 fun. We were talking about finding mechanics in the game as evidence to support why any given reason that the game is fun is more valid than the other. We ran into a problem that EU4's design is not so simply intentional as other games, and so finding out what the intention behind the game is takes a bit more time. With the understanding that each mechanic is added in to create a wider sandbox, it might be reasonable to say that Paradox's design intention is to create the widest possible quantification of an empire building simulator without compromising on depth. Even as we try to specify the analysis though, we continue to run into the same problem. The scope is so massive. What exactly is an empire building simulator? Are 4x games like Civilization and Endless Legend empire building simulators? If so, why are they vastly different than EU4? What do Civilization and Endless Legend share with Europa Universalis 4? Well, all three involve strategy, but that's horribly vague. We can focus that into saying that all three involve decision making, which is still quite vague. At a microscopic level though, it starts to have meaning. What sorts of decisions do you make in EU4, Civ, and Endless Legend? The answer is that you make decisions revolving around synergy and focused effort. The 4X games do this a bit differently though. The things your empire focuses on are with the intention of winning over others through some sort of win condition. All that separates EU4 from that is the lack of a deterministic win condition. In EU4, even if you conquer the world with a true one tag and don't have any EU subjects, the game keeps going. The game will never stop until you hit 1821, and considering that it is entirely possible and has been done to conquer the world with one tag by 1472, it's clear that even that isn't a true win condition. Therefore, we can distinguish EU4 from other empire building simulators via its lack of a win condition. Okay, so how does it help us understand why EU4 is fun though? It has to do with the aforementioned decision making. Decision making in the 4X games is informed by an intention to win. How is decision making informed in EU4? That would depend on the goal you're looking to accomplish, which leads us to yet another question. What goals are fun to accomplish in EU4? Clearly, the goal of EU4 in general is to build an empire, but that goal has all sorts of steps and sub goals to it, as well as having differently defined goal posts for each player. If I play England, my goal might be as simple as forming Great Britain. At that point, I have built an empire. But is my playthrough finished now? Depending on what I'm looking to accomplish, maybe I am done. In that sense, player choice is everything in EU4, unlike in the 4X games, where the challenge is the bar that the game sets for you. Zooming in a bit, what decisions along the way to the goal are fun and which aren't? 
Let's continue our 4x comparison and apply that to EU4. When playing Civ and Endless Legend, the fun is almost entirely in the macro management on a turn-by-turn -turn basis. Taking the time to evaluate which pop should work which resource and deciding whether to build units or buildings, and if so, which units and buildings are all strategic choices that expand in complexity as the game goes on. In particular, the fun moment for a 4x game is watching the accumulation of consequences of your decisions stack up. As your city stats get higher and higher, seeing population, production, and gold income increase over time thanks to your wise management is extremely satisfying, and using that advantage to topple your enemies feels even better. In that sense, EU4 and the 4x genre share the fun. EU4 is also about making strategic decisions which compound on themselves, except it's a bit different. EU4 is about working with what you have, rather than starting with nothing or very little how 4x games are. The fact that every nation has their own idea set and modifiers, their own mission trees and diplomatic positions, means that EU4 is a much more improvisational game than its 4x counterparts. In 4x games, everyone starts mostly the same. Different civilizations or empires have different specializations and they start with different resources around them, but it's a fairly even playing field. In EU4, the Ottomans are in a hugely advantaged position over the Byzantines. Not that that's ever stopped them from playing the Phoenix Rise. I'm getting ahead of myself there though. EU4 is all about modifier stacking at the end of the day. Stacking modifiers is the EU4 equivalent of the 4x resource generation fund. It always feels good to have 103% cavalry combat ability as Poland, or to have minus 95% core creation cost as the Mughals. But what feels even better is to crush your enemies using those modifiers. Watching your empire have a specialization that sets it above the competition, and knowing that it was your strategizing that got you there, is one of the most prevalent forms of fun in EU4, and we especially know that because the game's design takes those things into account and even encourages it. Overall, building an empire in EU4 is fun through the unique strategies and tactics that need to be employed for each nation's ascent to imperial domination. Nations like the Ottomans are well suited to military expansionism and tolerant rule, while a nation like Portugal is better suited to trade, colonization, and diplomacy. That doesn't mean the Ottomans can't use diplomacy or colonies, nor does it mean that Portugal can't wage war. Although they may use the same mechanics, each nation uses each mechanic in its own way to reach its goal. Some nations do get unique mechanics entirely unto themselves, like the Mughal Divan, which makes cultural differences no longer an issue, but for the most part, every nation operates with the same mechanical base. The decisions a player makes throughout their journey give it a sense of uniqueness, and even a power fantasy to some extent if the right modifiers are stacked up. That being said, for many lesser skilled players to even survive as a power trip in itself, systems like the Hegemons especially reinforce a sense of power trip and domination for players as well. So, we can add to the list of verifiably fun things a feeling of power tripping and strategic challenge and pride, giving us so far three forms of fun. Mastery, power trip, and strategic challenge. But surely that's not all. No, of course not, look at the length of the video. There's something that often gets ignored in EU4, and that is reading. Although a seasoned player will probably never read events, many new players or casual players enjoy a break from all the thinking to read some of the text in the game. Indeed, there are veritable novels of historical information to sift through in EU4 if you're willing to sit down and read it, much of which is infected with Paradox's sense of ironic and sarcastic humor. The fun of this aspect of EU4 is the desire to see new things, akin to an adventure game. Do I dare compare Dark Souls to EU4 in the fallout of reviewers saying everything is like Dark Souls? I do. Sitting at the bonfire reading about that boss soul you got a while back is one of the best experiences you can have in Dark Souls on a first time playthrough. That novelty of course does fade, but there genuinely is enough to read that I would call the item descriptions a part of the fun that Dark Souls exhibits as an adventure game. This reading novelty does as well apply to EU4. I will admit that I often skip through events, but the few times that I have read the events and the idea descriptions and the government type descriptions and technology descriptions, I have thoroughly enjoyed it and even learned a thing or two. Of course, the arbitrary historian in me acts like I've obtained a four-year bachelor's in history, which is not at all the case, but certainly the rabbit holes that U4 has put me in have been highly educational. I even took a course on the modern Middle East during my degree out of curiosity inspired by U4. I speak of the novelty of reading here, but novelty is actually a major inspiration for just about any U4 player. Forming new nations, mixing idea sets, testing strategies, or even just seeing what nations have interesting opening moves is a joy for many, and some YouTube channels even made a living off of this concept of picking nations at random and making guides to those opening moves. Player interest in such a thing is high, and we can even use the game's mechanics to reinforce this sense. Every nation in the game has some events unique to their nation, or at least to their region, which give a sense of uniqueness to them. Some of those events are bad, some are good, but they're all novel. They're all a form of support for either making the game harder or easier at times, while contributing to making it all interesting. Seeing all the events a nation can experience is good fun, even if there are missteps like Scandinavia, where forming that tag actually robs you of the event novelty that Sweden, Denmark, and Norway all have. 
Regardless of any missteps, novelty is a huge part of EU4 when it comes to the beginner and intermediate end of the player base, but even the advanced players find new forms of novelty. Trying out strategies or playing around with the way mechanics interact is all a heavy form of novelty which streamers like Flurry Worry and Lambda often engage in. Although perhaps an unexpected and strange comparison, Dark Souls and EU4 do in fact share in the form of adventure, and to some extent even difficulty, although extremely different types of difficulty of course. The same thirst to see what's around the corner that we find in Elden Ring finds its way into EU4, which to me is just extremely impressive. Many dedicated adventure games don't get me wanting to see what's next as well as EU4 does. If reading's not your thing though, we can go to the other end of the academic uh, world. We talked about Lambda earlier, and one thing he really loves is math. Now Paradox is pretty famous for its misrepresentative math and inability to get straight how the game systems do non-whole numbers, but we have guys like Lambda and his community to figure that stuff out for us. Now I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm in an art program. I study linguistics and psychology. I teach French and Spanish for a day job. I'm a filmmaker. I know just about nothing when it comes to math, although I did pass pre-calculus in high school and I've had several of my math-oriented buddies try to explain the proof behind 1 plus 1 to me. This is one of those aspects of the game that I simply do not engage in. I enjoy stacking modifiers and I enjoy calculating if the overextension will reach 100, but remember, I'm the guy who constantly submits speedruns where the in-game time counts are wrong because I can't do the math to figure out how long the game has been running. That being said, I can understand in principle the fun of having an idea and executing it. Similarly to a linguistic dataset solution, EU4 often involves a bit of trial and error. Testing theories and the satisfaction of them being correct, along with the grind of retesting and applying new knowledge to future problems, is actually pretty unique to EU4. I'm reminded of something like Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous or any class build oriented RPG game. I use Pathfinder as my comparison because that game is so complex at the character planning level, even if individual mechanics aren't too horribly complex, the ways in which the player chooses to approach them can branch out into almost infinite possibilities. In Pathfinder, the plan you make and the math you do is most of the fun of character building. Although some players will enjoy improvising a character build according to the events of the game, as I've often done, I enjoy an entirely planned character because of the opportunity to watch a plan unfold, as well as the opportunity to learn from the failures of that plan. Pathfinder is not quite as replayable as something like EU4, but when examining just the tabletop game in isolation from the video game adaptation, Pathfinder is about as replayable as EU4, considering it too is a sandbox. The math in Pathfinder, I will say, is extremely consistent and well-defined in comparison to EU4's, although part of me believes the inconsistency of EU4's math actually makes it more fun for the math wizards that play the game. A bit of randomness makes everything a little more exciting, no? It's one of those aspects of fun that I would actually say isn't so supported by the game, particularly because of how hidden away and inaccurate much of the math is. Does Paradox want players to experiment with their math how they do? I'm not so sure about that. But at times, Paradox does make effort to make EU4's math more transparent, so maybe they do intend for this to be a form of fun that players engage in. Regardless, many players do engage in it, whether desired or not. I'm going to include another small intermission here to go over what we've talked about so far, just to help tie things together for you, the dear viewer. I know these long video essays can sometimes get lost in the muck of details, so let's zoom out for a second. The question we're answering is why is EU4 fun? This question so far has turned out to be extremely complex due to EU4's multifaceted nature as a uniquely grand, grand strategy game. I'm working backwards by continually asking questions and providing answers so that the sum of those answers might add up to a full answer to the first question. The way I've been trying to identify those questions and answers has been by comparing it to other more strongly focused games and examining each of those types of fun individually with the hope of later combining those analyses into one larger look. So far, we've examined EU4 from the perspective of mastery, meaningful strategy, novelty, and planned execution. These things all tie into the game to an extent significant enough for me to note them. There's yet more to explore, but please, take these next moments to digest and come back if need be, as we dive into the ways that EU4 is fun externally, and then later tie them all together once again. So one external factor is actually the sense of community around players' favorite games and the in-jokes that only players of those games could understand. EU4 is perhaps one of the most insular communities out there simply due to the amount of prerequisite knowledge required to get many of the memes you can find about this game. Besides memes though, EU4 has an extremely proud community. To be a member of the EU4 community is to care for history and to play a skill-oriented game. It is to invest hundreds if not thousands of hours into a game that demands your attention and skill. For many people, to even understand how to play EU4 is an accomplishment, let alone to be good at it in any way. At its best, this creates a sense of camaraderie amongst EU4 players, but at its worst can create a sense of superiority over other gamers as it turns outsiders away from EU4. Regardless, the community aspect in EU4 is a powerful source of fun. The stories that players tell each other and the memes they share are very much part of the experience. I participated in some Reddit posts or Twitch stream chats discussing my exploits and heard my fair share of stories. 
The passion with which many people share their stories is impressive. I will admit that I don't get quite that same level of joy from it, but I can respect those people who do enjoy it so much. When players build up an identity around the games they play, then they become extremely attached to those games. I don't have to go far in history to show examples of that. In fact, I don't even have to go into history. Tribalism amongst gamers is still very much so a prevalent issue in the mainstream. Whether it's Minecraft and Roblox, Call of Duty and Halo, and so on and so forth, identity is central to many games. EU4 is no exception, of course. The identity is one of the central reasons that EU4 is fun for its players. To identify with the game is one thing, but to identify with the community is another. And even beyond that is to identify with the particular community leader. Each of the various EU4 content creators is like their own sub-community of EU4. With guys like Flurryworry, Habibi, Ludi, Monk, Lambda, and social streamers being some of my favorites. Each of these content creators could be their own video when it comes to analyzing their playstyles and how that playstyle comes through in terms of gameplay. But let's focus it back on how these content creators contribute to the EU4 culture around them. Now, the term parasocial is thrown around a lot. And if you don't already know, a parasocial relationship is when viewers develop what they feel is a personal relationship with a person they've never met before. It's common in celebrity culture, but with the way Twitch, YouTube, and Discord allow viewers to interact with their online idols, the effect is multiplied heavily for content creator communities. With each of these content creators, there's a sense of identity around playstyle, opinions, and even other games they play. The sub-communities that players participate in also are determined by their respective content creators. If you watch Habibi, you probably play multiplayer. If you watch Lambda, you're a nerd. If you watch social streamers, you like to use console commands, and so on. That's an in-joke to the social streamer community, this is not an accusation. Please don't hurt me, Lathe stands. I'm sorry. How does all that contribute to the fun of EU4, though? Well, it certainly is fun to be in a community and to feel important. Many of these content creators do a great job of pulling their audience into their videos and streams. Although I'm not so much of an EU4 Andy to participate myself, I do love watching those events when they come up. And even through just watching, I feel connected to the community. Paradox definitely encourages these sorts of relationships with how they handle community events and how they support the content creators they approve of. Seeing Paradox give out early access keys, seeing them post impressive feats on their official Twitter and Facebook accounts from content creators, and even events like the grandest LAN parties they host inform us of their approval of these relationships. Paradox wants their community to form these relationships because they know it makes players more attached to the game. This has been known to bite them sometimes when content creators may have negative opinions towards new patches and new DLCs. So many players are more loyal to their content creator of choice than to the company making the games. That's a risk Paradox is willing to take so, it seems though. Paradox has even stepped into these parasocial world themselves with their own streams featuring their developers and artists, although I'm not sure it would be as effective as the external content creator's attempts. Regardless, Paradox's condoning of EU4 content creation and participation in it themselves shows it to be an intentional aspect of the EU4 experience. Whether condoning parasocial relationships and attachment to distant figures is something you approve of or not, it certainly is a reason people get attached to the game. So you mentioned the content creators themselves and the developers, we can talk about something else that also applies to both those groups. Anticipation is one of the smaller forms of fun for EU4, if only because it only comes up every once in a while. When a new DLC is coming out, many people feel a great sense of anticipation for what's coming. That feeling of waiting for whatever Paradox has in store, hoping it won't break the game, or in some cases hoping it will break the game. The armchair game designer in all of us comes out when a new patch is about to drop. I know this because Crusader Kings 3's newest flavor pack came out pretty recently, and I'm having the exact same experience as many European Universe House 4 players. I've been poring over every dev diary and discussing both my expectations and predictions for the paid and unpaid features, even theorizing about what bugs may get fixed or what new bugs will be introduced. This sort of community interaction is the biggest part of the fun of the game experience outside playing it. Similar to any game can be compared to this, but in particular, the sorts of games that go through continuous development and updates. Think of games like the aforementioned League of Legends. People love speculating about new champions, new seasons, new updates, new items, and so on. Those communities, for better or worse, thrive off the drops of information passed down by the developers. EU4, and in general all Paradox games, are in the rare situation of having developers that create development diaries with a lot more detail than most gamers could ever expect. Many would say rightfully so given the money invested into the various DLCs the game has to offer. Those dev diaries are by no means unique to Paradox, let alone EU4, but the perfect storm of high cost, passionate development team, and an invested community has created a concoction of hype around every new release. Much like with League of Legends, those releases are sometimes loved, sometimes hated, but never ignored. That's one thing that every Paradox gamer can agree on. No update is slept on. No update is overlooked. That's the nature of these games in general. That anticipation is a powerful tool in creating the community and the hype that adds to the fun of EU4. Similar to the in-game novelty of events and nations, these dev diaries spur on players who might have hit a slump and stopped playing to come back, and getting still invested players to keep their stock. Beyond even the dev diaries, we can tie anticipation back to the content creators from before. The analyses that content creators come up with are sometimes so compelling that even people who don't play the game anymore seek out those videos. 
I for one barely play EU4 outside of the occasional foray back in when a patch comes out. But I watched all sorts of content creators videos about new mission trees, national ideas, and nation spotlights. The hype around EU4 when new content is coming may also speak to the almost drug-like effect of the gamble every EU4 patch presents to the community. If you've been following EU4, you know that Leviathan, the DLC, was famously the most downvoted product on Steam to ever exist for a time, and it may have been one of the buggiest messes we've gotten from Paradox in a long time, yet it still sold, and was talked about to no end. Paradox did eventually patch their way into the good graces of its community again, but imagine the reaction that could have spawned if any other developer had pulled something like that off. Although EU4's community dug into them and criticized, and really let Paradox know of their upset, the game goes on without a hitch, weathering the storm. Paradox continues on its merry way with a community that never forgets, but which quickly forgives. That isn't to say Paradox didn't deserve that forgiveness, but that's up to each individual's belief. I'm meandering though now about Paradox's reputation, forgive me. The point of all this is the sense of hype and anticipation behind new releases from Paradox and how that contributes to an external factor of fun using both a sense of community and a sort of drug-like addiction that players may unwittingly fall to with each patch. Moving on from Paradox the Development Studio, the final sort of external aspect to EU4's fun, I would say, is the appearance of education. I say appearance because some people treat EU4 like it's a history degree in itself, when in reality it's like a history survey course. I'll never discount the information EU4 has spurred me on to read about, but much like the novelty section of the game, you've got to take the time to read it all for it to be of any value. The historical research put into the game is deep, and many players can develop a solid base of historical information from playing. That being said, some players might be misled into thinking things are simpler than they really are, or they might neglect to do further research, but to pretend that EU4 has no ability to teach its players anything is just wrong. As a university student who has taken many history courses, EU4 has actually given me a solid foundation for many of those courses, although it certainly was no replacement for the classes themselves. Although not everyone would mark learning about history as fun, I certainly would, as do many EU4 players. Many of these players' sole historical education is EU4, and a few online Reddit debates of course, along with some Wikipedia surfing here and there of particular topics that the game can't quite scratch. It's impressive to me that a game could get the curiosities of so many people going. In particular, when players realize what most of the mechanics in EU4 are abstractions of, they learn a lot about how an empire is run. Being able to read a Wikipedia article about some historical event and relating those events to a mechanic in EU4 is, although dubious at times, certainly a ton of fun. There's almost even a sense of pride for EU4 players who may vehemently defend their historical positions using knowledge they've garnered from external research that was motivated by their EU4 gaming. If you haven't seen any EU4 discords or subreddits, then you really should check it out sometime and see the arguments take place. This is common to all Paradox games, but the nature of EU4 as a game makes these things a little more common for that particular game. As a person more strongly into the Crusader Kings community, that community has its heated arguments as well, but in general, the atmosphere of CK3 is a lot more chill. The competitive nature of EU4 spills into these historical debates, and it certainly can be fun or torturous to engage in. That being said, the point of this section is that for some people, learning and debating like a pseudo-academic can be an immense source of fun that keeps them coming back to the game. Okay, that was a, that was a long section. We're going to have another intermission here, the last intermission for this video. What's up next is basically all of my opinions about EU4. We're going to discuss the parts of the game I love, the parts I hate, and present to you why I believe those things. From here, I won't necessarily prove all of my opinions, but rather present them with some loose justifications about why I believe them, and let you, the dear viewer, decide if you agree or not. Let's not waste any time here, so pause the video, use the washroom, get a snack, whatever you'd like to do, and without further ado, let's resume. It's always been really hard for me to pin down exactly what I like about EU4, but after working on this video for quite a while, and really considering my opinion strongly, I've come to some conclusions. Using my own analysis, I've decided that what I love about EU4 is the novelty aspect, the empire building aspect, and the anticipation for each update. For me, the fun of EU4 sits in the power trip of modifiers stacking with new nations or old ones. Finding new ways to dominate your opponents using the routes best suited to a particular nation, or even routes not suited to a particular nation, is a ton of fun for me. Learning how to most efficiently choose idea groups and advisors that match national ideas to create the most specialized possible nation which can rule the world is a huge part of the empire building that I enjoy. I like to conceptualize what my nation actually does and how it governs based on the government reforms and modifiers I've attached to it. The Ottomans may be one nation in the game with one set of ideas, but choosing to play them with innovative and humanist idea groups or religious and influence ideas can radically alter the way I envision the nation as a whole. To me, those visions of empire building are what make me enjoy the game. Some of my favorite playthroughs are religious idea Sikh Mughals or Poland into Prussia among many others. These sorts of unique and well-architected playthroughs really appeal to my creative sense as a player make me happy to build my complex sandcastles here in EU4's sandbox. 
Alongside that, the novelty of each playthrough certainly makes me happy. Seeing the new events for each nation, reading the mission trees, reading the idea descriptions, all of these things make me enjoy coming back to E4. There's still dozens of nations I've never even clicked on to play before with paragraphs of information about their ideas, which one day I hope to get to, if only for the novelty. There are many nations with unique events, like Switzerland, that I've yet to experience. Beyond the actual readings of EU4, the mechanical novelty is something I still come back for. There are many interactions to mechanics I haven't quite figured out to this day, which I hope to understand one day. I really enjoy watching Lambda's streams for that particular reason, since he often explains things well, or at least his chat does when he can't. I still remember when I started to play around with cultural conversion and how this affected tag switching. Back in the day before endgame tags, I did an Ottomans into Byzantium playthrough, which, although extremely cursed, was a ton of fun. Mixing and matching Byzantine events with Ottoman ideas made for a unique playthrough, and understanding the routes to take for becoming certain tags was like a fun adventure. Having the knowledge to go from Ottomans to Georgia to Byzantium was the sort of thing that made me feel like I was good at the game, even though in reality, that's only scratching the surface of tag switching meta. From watching Lambda's World Conquest's Oirat, which he pulled off in just 30 years, I saw all the tag switching he did for just small modifiers like the movement speed bonus from one of Tunis' missions. These sorts of details and experiences make up a large part of the fun for me, just as a more casual level. Beyond the actual mechanical fun of it though, the aforementioned conceptualization of that nation changing its identity was always fun to imagine. I can't think of why possibly the Ottomans would adopt the Georgian identity, but in my alternative universe they sure did. Out there in one of the many multiverses, I'm sure the same thing has happened in real life. The great thing about EU4's novelty is that because of the consistent updates and patches that Paradox puts out for the game, that novelty never really runs dry. Even when I think I've seen most of the game, there's always more to see. I remember when Rogers of India came out, I jumped in to play India again, after having not touched them for a long time. It was like playing the game all over again, even though ultimately it was the same basis of mechanics. Although I'm not one to fall for the hype train, I do admit that I get excited for each and every dev diary and each update coming for EU4. The work that Paradox puts into them is apparent, and this transparency is appreciated as someone who is several hundred dollars deep into the game. It's one of those things where this transparency is almost required due to the immense cost of the game with all its DLCs. To sum it up, what I love about EU4 is the novelty of new nations, mechanics, and events, as well as the empire building. Watching my once small and broadly talented empire become a force unto its own through a sharp focus on our particular power feels like a wonderful story that really piques my imagination. Beyond that, anticipation for new updates, reading about the development process really pulls me into the game and gives me some light reading that I genuinely enjoy. From here though, we do now have to talk about what I don't like, dare I even say hate, about EU4. Indeed, hate is a powerful word, but I have to admit that sometimes EU4 does pull some vitriolic feelings here and there. That abusive relationship I had mentioned all the way at the beginning of this video is, at least for me, all too real. EU4 is an immensely frustrating game. I just want it to work, but sometimes it refuses to work with me. Some mechanics don't add up or are unintuitive. Some information is poorly communicated or outright false. The UI can feel dated, which honestly it is. The AI is unfortunately quite, uh, special, we can say. The game balance often feels, well, unbalanced. Idea groups like Maritime and Naval and Espionage, Espionage has been fixed a little bit lately, but you know what I mean, are left by the wayside. And even idea groups like Defensive can feel bad to take because the only reason we're even grabbing it is that 15% army morale. Idea groups like Administrative can feel railroading because to do any sort of wide playthrough of any game, you need it for that 25% core creation cost reduction, but the rest of it's pretty much meaningless. This is actually a recurring issue in EU4, the meta. This is a pervasive issue for me, thanks to the role meta plays in CK3. But we find the same issue here in EU4. If you're not playing to the meta, are you really playing EU4? I've never felt incentivized to play the game in any way outside of the optimal way. When the Age of Absolutism arrives, it doesn't matter what kind of nation I'm running, it's time to stack up Absolutism. In some sense, I could argue that that's also the nature of Empire building, but whether justified or not, it feels like railroading. Another thing I dislike is some of the rigidity of the game, with particular respect to peace deals. In EU4, there is a winner and a loser in a war. In a white piece, the attacker is the loser. What about wars that come to a compromise? One thing I've always thought about would be interesting would be an expansion of diplomacy as a means of conquest, but not just pure diplomacy, I mean Bismarck-esque diplomacy. It's funny to say EU4 feels rigid because how free the game often is, but at the same time, the more freedom the game gives, the more I as a player want. EU4 as a game is railroaded into being a war game, and perhaps that's best. In fact, I even argue that keeping EU4 focused on being a war game is for the best, yet it still feels limiting. That I would say is EU4's biggest problem, the railroading. Paradox is likely aware of this with how they update the game because we see alternative playstyles being made viable with each patch. Yet those alternate playstyles often fall short of the traditional wide empire building game that EU4 is best as. Playing tall in EU4 is a fun novelty for some time, but it eventually becomes a mere button clicking simulator since there are no further mechanics for building tall. War in EU4 is a highly complex symphony of mechanics, but playing tall is just one mechanic, development, 
with a few other smaller supporting mechanics. But that leads me to another bigger problem in EU4, Power Creep. In case you're unaware, Power Creep is when a mechanic becomes useless because it is supplanted by a new superior mechanic. Now, EU4 doesn't suffer from direct power creep, like what happens to the like Hearthstone. It's not like a mechanic becomes entirely useless, rather it becomes sidelined. For example, mercantilism in EU4 is essentially a pointless mechanic, especially since all the new mechanics around investing money into creating massive trade ports came in. Mercantilism once was one of the only ways to gain more trade power per province, and so it was useful. But now mercantilism is essentially a way to throw away diplomatic points when you're near the cap. That's because if I want to gain trade power per province, I guess upgrade my centers of trade, or build more trade buildings. Sometimes, I get the sense that Paradox wants to add new ways to play EU4, but they don't want to invest your resources into creating anything fleshed out. For example, the sell province interaction is sort of a way to trade provinces, but the AI is so unwilling to accept any such deals that's a useless mechanic that was clearly put in to check off a box of innovative mechanics. Even though the existence of sell provinces as a mechanic is good, it ultimately only sees use in extremely specific and specialized situations. This to me makes it not really worth having. Even certain espionage actions, like infiltrate administration, just feel rather pointless. Sure, it's useful, but I never feel incentivized to use it. Where opinions will differ is whether or not my lack of use for infiltrate administration and sell province is a skill issue or a game issue. Like, everyone can have their view on it, but beyond that, a fact is that EU4 has many obscure and downright useless mechanics. I didn't even talk about bugginess or performance issues in my opinion section because ultimately no one likes bugs performance issues and as prevalent as they are in EU4, to mention them as a negative is like saying murder is bad. We all know it already, there's no reason to go over what is universally agreed on. Overall, the major criticisms I have for EU4 are its deceptive mechanics and false information, its railroaded playstyles, and its useless mechanics. Those things definitely bring the game down for me, but at the same time, I could sit here and defend a lot of it too as a Deadpool's advocate. It's one of those things where part of EU4's charm as a game is that it's a little bit crazy. It might key your car, and it probably gaslights you. It's sad how effective it is, yet it remains effective. Those are basically my opinions for EU4, so that kind of wraps up my analysis of it. I put this video together because I didn't really see any videos of this type talking about EU4, and I wanted to fill in that content gap. But I'm not the most experienced nor most skilled EU4 player, with only 2,500 hours in the game. But I believe that I've articulated effectively several answers to the question of why EU4 is fun. Along with that, I've explained some of my opinions, both positive and negative, so that you, the dear viewer, might have a better idea of why you find EU4 fun. I'd absolutely love to hear some of your opinions down in the comments, since I'm always curious about how other people will view the same game differently. Your perspectives are neither lesser nor greater than my own, and I may even change my mind or see things in other ways if you commenters can say something compelling enough. My final conclusions on EU4 are that it is a fun game with many flaws, but flaws which don't pull too heavily away from my idea of fun. EU4 could be approved upon in all sorts of ways, but it will never quite please every player. Some people love EU4 how it is, some hate it, and some are somewhere in the middle. But all that matters is that you know what your opinion is and you're able to have a good discussion about it so that everyone can feel like they're heard. EU4 is a legendary game with a legendary community. It's the kind of game that inevitably becomes part of your identity as a person by pure hours of play. Any game that can consume thousands of the finite hours you have on Earth will become part of who you are. Some people take it more strongly into identity than others, but they all do. If you're new to EU4 or haven't played it before, I'm going to give the warning that all EU4 players give to prospective players. Get out while you still can. Once this game pulls you in, you'll never get out.